Hello, and welcome back to this year's XR Access Symposium. Uh, I'm your host for this panel. My name is Eric Lohr. I am the audio lead for Yahoo Riot Studios. Um, here we do a lot of uh, XR VR content um, with uh, specifically my, my role is, uh, is how audio plays a, a role in the storytelling process. And so that is a really nice way to kind of bridge us into our, our, our next panel, um, which is the uh, topic of inclusive VR and media. Um, today, I'm joined by a fantastic group of uh, panelists. Uh, today, we have Danny Woodburn, uh, actor and Hollywood advocate. Uh, we have Athena Demos, who is the co-founder of Big Rock Creative VR and collaborator on the Blind Burners Project. Uh, Delbert Wetter, who is the vice chair on the board of directors of Respectability and Damien Turcaya, director of the Realidad 360 Argentina and VR director uh, extraordinaire. Um, welcome, everyone. It's great to have you on board. Thank you. Thank you. So I think what, uh, what, how we should start this out is um, let's just uh, take a moment to um, introduce yourselves and um, talk about your your involvement in, 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 this, in this space and uh, what, uh, what you're passionate about and why you're here. Uh, Danny, let's start with you. Thank you. Um, I, I just have only recently come to the uh, virtual reality space. Uh, I was sort of delving into it, um, mostly at my wife's suggestion. And uh, I discovered that there are potentially some significant um, exclusionary aspects to the virtual reality space. Um, <clears throat> I work in uh, film television, and my whole my whole process has been to make sure that there's authentic representation for people with disabilities, as well as equal access to opportunity and employment and education in in film and television. So, knowing that the shift is going to eventually happen, I mean, we're going to start to see films, we're going to start to see these things in the VR space. We'll be watching films on our devices. And uh, I just want to make sure that that unlike the film industry, we are not left behind for a long period of time because the, only the shift has been happening in film and television for like the last six years. Prior to that, there has been virtually like no shift in the hiring of and the inclusion of persons with disabilities uh, in front of and behind the camera. So that's been my goal to uh, come into this space and try to make sure that we don't we don't fall by the wayside. <laughs> Great. And uh, I know that you've um you've been involved in quite a bit of advocacy yourself. Um can you explain maybe what um uh, one one or two of those of those um those undertakings? Yeah, so so um uh, I I'm co-vice chair of the Performers with Disabilities Committee at SAG after I've been involved in that for at least 25 years. Um, and, you know, my whole goal there, as I said, is to try to make the shift for people with disabilities in this space. Uh, I think I really sort of lost my stuff <laughs> a few years ago when the um, Oscar So White campaign came out, and then there was a push to be more inclusive at the Motion Picture Academy. Uh, and in doing so, they brought in 100 new folks um, <laughs> that were supposed to be from diverse backgrounds, which they were with the exclusion of people with disabilities. So this, this whole uh, movement to include marginalized communities has been largely exclusionary of people with disabilities. And so I, I wrote an article for the Huffington Post called, If You Don't Really Mean Inclusion, Shut the F Up. And that got a lot of attention. And then from there, I brought the Ruderman Family Foundation into Hollywood and they, together, we made a lot of shifts with regard to uh, to that exclusion. Um, so that that's sort of been my my impetus for, for helping to make these shifts. So all these changes that have been happening were sparked by that, by that moment, the, the Oscar So White campaign being exclusionary. And when I say, I went to the Motion Picture Academy at that time and, and the then president, actually said that people with disabilities would be included so long as they met one of the other criteria of a marginalized community, which is not how disability inclusion works. 
Yeah, certainly a, a, a long road ahead of us. Um, but uh, these these steps along the way are um, are are the direction we need to go. Uh, uh, Athena, can you please tell us about uh, your involvement? Uh, sure. I, I am relatively new to the uh, XR space. Uh, starting at the beginning of COVID in 2020, I helped bring the Burning Man community into VR through BRCVR, which I helped co-found. And one of the projects that I was very passionate about bringing into this space was the Blind Burners Project, which uh, on uh, Playa at Burning Man, they walk around with people who have low vision, are visually impaired, and talk them through the art that they're seeing. And of course, at Burning Man, you could put your hands on everything. So you can touch it and see the texture and feel the textures and uh, have somebody explain it to you. So I really wanted that camp to participate in BRCVR, but virtual reality posed a huge problem for those with low vision. Uh, so the very first year that they were able to present something in BRCVR, it was more about sharing artwork by people that were visually impaired uh, with those that were sighted. And that just wasn't enough. So now we're very excited to announce in partnership with Microsoft that we are trying to build navigational tools and other tools that will help people with low vision uh, be able to participate in a virtual reality space. Have no idea what those are, tools are going to be yet because we are just at the very beginning of it, but I'm excited that we are pursuing these possibilities. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, I actually had a the opportunity to speak with, uh, with with one of those tours a few years ago at, uh, on the playa, and um, they were uh, it was a it was it was a really um, really amazing thing to see um, how much people were getting out of the art without being able to physically see it. I mean, especially some of the most the more interactive types of projects. Um, it was fantastic. So, um, Delbert, can you please talk about your work in this space? about my background first, a little bit about myself. I'm the co-founder of a video production company named Exodus Film Group. And I'm the CEO, Chief Operating Officer of it as well, and film, film producer. I've been doing that for a while and working with animation, live action films, documentary films, all of those different varieties and venues. I'm the vice chair for an organization called Respect Ability. And I'm doing a lot of things and working together with Hollywood studios throughout, making connections for inclusion, representation, and for authentic representation of people with disabilities. Um, just been involved with disability advocacy and inclusion. Really, it's so inspiring, inspiring to see people, like Danny was saying, you know, having co-wrote the white papers. That's so challenging to make those changes and everything, and to wake up people out there and get their eyes on the paper and show them what's happening. And mostly, really not mostly, but almost all of the characters perform our performer performers themselves have no disabilities when they're actually disabled people and i don't really think you know it needs to become inclusionary representative you know and it really it needs to become you know a labor labor equality issue so that's so important and I enjoy the uh, film industry having some difficulty, though, understanding this is disability. They have disability trouble understanding the disability community. And I do consulting work in that regard. Originally, many conversations I've had is like, why disabled people need to be included? Why is that important? And explaining those reasons. And I'm noticing there's less and less problem now with having those kinds of dialogues and just connecting with what's best practices development, character development, story development, storyline, 
and then just casting, you know, front of the camera as well as behind the camera. And producers, directors, writers, all those different people. Also marketing as well, you know, technical representation, having those dialogues and they're happening now. That's really a big step in the right direction forward. So there's a lot of more work that needs to be done in that regard. And personally, I'm fascinated with VR. I'm just really, it's, I can get immersed in that, especially for deaf people, people who ASL is a language. It's a 3D language, as you know. So having it on the screen, 2D, And that improves uh, the audio. Sorry, and that improves understanding and connection with the audience. We had an interpreter problem, sorry. A connection problem. I believe we have a, a, a bit of a connection issue with our in, interpreter team, um, which um, perhaps uh, goes to show that there's still a lot of work to be done in this space in terms of connecting um, <laughs> connecting each other from an, on an accessible level. Um, the work does not stop here, and it absolutely likely should should never stop. <laughs> I was I was going to um, comment, uh, if I may, uh, about the sure. XR, XR space. Um, when I first uh, put on my device and was allowed to uh, choose an avatar and, and, and sort of dress the avatar, I noticed a few things like um, for some reason there wasn't an option to say select a wheelchair uh, or maybe some other assistive device. And so there's this idea that you, <clears throat> you shouldn't want to select those things even though people identify in that space. I myself, like if I wanted to put in my height in this one particular meeting program, there was a height minimum. <laughs> so uh, I didn't meet the height minimum, so I couldn't be represented the way I felt I should be represented in this particular uh, application. So I feel like there's a long way to go in, in, in this space, just from the, from the onset in understanding this community. And I think that, a symposium like this is very important because I think some of the creators don't have an awareness. And the reason they don't have an awareness is because the creators aren't engaging with the community, which tells me also that folks aren't hired in the disability community to be some of the creators of these applications or these devices. So that's that's really um, unfortunate. And it's important that that steps get taken to engage with all these, you know, unicorns that are out there, all these amazing companies that are coming, coming around the corner uh, for, say, the Oculus, and make sure that these folks have an awareness of this community. Sure, yeah, that's a, that's a great point, and it speaks, it speaks a lot to what Delbert was just mentioning about um, starting kind of from the top and not just, okay, we, Apple has, you know, the Academy Award for Coda, like, resting on those laurels, you know, it, it starts higher than that, and it, it has to continue higher and higher and higher from the producer level all the way down to hiring of actors and in the case of VR, for instance, um, developers, um, test groups, user groups. Um, I think user experience is kind of key for everything for this when, especially with VR, where we put a headset on, like you mentioned, if you're, if you don't meet the height limitation or if you can't see what options you have to, to work with, then what's the point? And it kind of, you start to deter people at a certain point. So if steps aren't taken, then it, you you lose a lot of potential. Um, you lose a, a lot of potential people that could benefit in the long run. Um, and, and, and and frankly, there's a lot of revenue. I mean, th this community makes up 25% of the population. 
And, you know, we all come from multiply diverse backgrounds. And that revenue is has been studied. And the revenue is approximately $490 billion in discretionary spending. So you're really sort of, you know, uh, behind the times when, when understanding what the potential is for the opportunity. And, you know, these studies are out there. This information's out there. And it's amazing to me that companies do not gr grab onto it. <clears throat> so let's go, let's move on to Damien, because I think one of the big things about this is creating fun experiences for people to get in into and, um, and, and starting, starting there and connecting the dots with the development side of things to make things more accessible. So Damien, let's, let's talk about what, uh, what, what you've been working on and what, what your passion is in this space. Um, hello everyone. Um, I'm very happy to, to be here sharing uh, our experience and thank you for having me. Um, my passion is for uh, telling stories um, and, and mixing uh, storytelling with different uh, technologies. I come from a background of audiovisual, uh, doing a lot of uh, videos for, for cinema, for TV, and music videos also. And about eight years ago, uh, I started doing immersive content, uh, more uh, 360 video, specifically uh, here in, in Argentina, in South America. So I started like the, the, the first production house uh, focused in immersive media uh, here in Argentina. And in, in my work, I do like a, two different type of contents like uh, documentaries, uh, fiction films, uh, a lot of branded content for, for, for brands. Um, and what my passion is more for the artistic content and the the storytelling uh, for a like for a better world, let's say like this, like VR for good. Um, and in that kind of content, um, we've done uh, some uh, very nice uh, series called uh, Four Feet High. Uh, it's a series about uh, disability and sexuality. Um, this series we started like uh, in 2018. Um, we've made like a, a, a project and we sent it to Vienna College of Venice on the, the project from, from the festival. Uh, uh, we, we've been chosen. Uh, we could travel to Venice to, to have some some master classes and and develop the project and we do we did a short film um and with this short film we we premiere in in venice in 2018 and then we went to um sundance and we went to south by southwest we won there the best 360 narrative and this content was a short film of 18 minutes of um a fiction about a woman that a young woman that uh, she start to to explore her sexuality and is a user of a wheelchair so uh, we wanted to do a series with this project so uh, we wrote the the full series and we started to look for um, co-producers and we found Art de France for co-produce this, this series. And yeah, I hear some hiss from someone. Sorry. Um, okay, we can continue. So uh, we started to do the, the full series. The full series, uh, what, what we understand when we did the first chapter, the first like a pilot episode, is that VR is not so inclusive because in the series we we talk about inclusion, diversity, um, and disability, and we found that is 
the VR medium is not inclusive because not all the people have access to a, a VR headset. So we are, we are very limited in, in the users, in the people, our audience that, that can see the work. So we managed to do a, like a mixed uh, technology series where we, we made four chapters for virtual reality and we made six chapters for flat video, like for normal um, 169 uh, series. So we can uh, go to both uh, platforms and people without a VR headset can access to the content. Um, and that's it. Um, I hope, I don't know, anyone can, can see it now. It's on, it's live on, on YouTube for free uh, in Art de France channel, uh, only sh limited to Europe by now. Um, and that's it. Um, what, what is important is we got um, the director is Maria Belen Poncio. The co-director is Rosario Perasolo. She's on, she has a disability. She's on a wheelchair also. And the main character uh, also is uh, a young woman in a wheelchair. It's uh, Marisol Irigoshen. So we have uh, people with disability behind the camera and in front of the camera. That was like a very important part. Yeah. Um, That's great. And, and now I am more, sorry. It's okay. Oh, now no, I, was, I am. I was actually Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I, I was curious to know how you casted uh, your main character, because we talk about representation, and it, it, I think casting is one of those really interesting um, things that I'm sure Danny can speak a lot more to. But I'm curious in your scenario, um, how did you find your main character? Well, in our in our scenario, at, at the first uh, pilot episode, we did a casting, and we tried to find. Um, a young woman with disability to be the the main character of of the short film, and you know we did a, like a not so big search and we couldn't find one that uh, can do the character and got the physical role um, appropriate. So we didn't for the pilot we didn't work with a, a character with disability, and when we did the main series. We say, okay, now uh, let's do it with a uh, with a woman with a uh, disability, and we had to uh, do a much bigger casting. We did a casting here at Buenos Aires, uh, physically presential. We did another one at uh, the city of Cordoba, where we shoot. It's uh, the second city here in Argentina, and we do we did also a virtual casting for all the people <coughs> that couldn't go physically to a, to a place. So we, di we did it by, by Zoom, a uh, video call. Um, you know, the, the, the main character that we end choosing, she couldn't go to the casting. She did it by the, the video call. So it so was a, a good option to, to have this like three different uh, ways of doing the, the casting. That's fantastic. Um, I haven't seen it yet, and I'm looking forward to checking it out after this uh, after this symposium is over. Um, so we've discussed um, some key topics. We've discussed representation, um, advocacy, um, the tools to make to make it possible for people to get in VR. So that's UI, UX types of um, discussions. What are some of the other challenges that we face and um, that potentially have ways to, uh, to so challenges that have that have means to be solved at this point um if anyone has any any um any ideas sure danny um i i think uh to uh the the gentleman's um pursuit of casting you know it, it comes down to opportunities and and opportunities only come through engagement on a broader scale see traditionally just speaking from my professional own uh people with disabilities have been harder to find because for one they don't have the same access they don't have equal access to education 
they don't have equal access to opportunities. So, so just a few years ago, I auditioned for a role of a character in a wheelchair myself. Um, and the character, you don't really know if the character is in the wheelchair or not. However, this, this door should have been open to a person in a wheelchair, an actor in a wheelchair, but the audition was on the second floor of a building. And this is, you know, <laughs> this is post ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act here in the States. So this is, <laughs> if you're already unconsciously biased against working with a person with disability by placing your audition for a character in a wheelchair on the second floor, you're not gonna be able to create these opportunities. So that, that's only a few years ago. So these engagements with, um, you know, you, we have a number of resources here in the States now. And we've, we've compiled so many different professional organizations uh, that work in this space that we can tell the studios and the networks, hey, this is where you have to go to look. Um, we're in the process uh, through our organization, ADA Lead On Productions, of creating a searchable database that will be international. We can already populate it with well over a thousand uh, folks um, in front of and behind the camera. We produced, um, ADA Lead On Productions produced four shows last year, uh, on, on Zoom, effectively on Facebook Live. And um, these shows employed only performers and uh, technicians and craftspeople with disability. That, that was the whole point of it. So we have the resources out there, but when my, my friend in South America there stated that his search was not wide, you know, it's about figuring out where to go um, initially. You know, he said his search was not a wide search. So you have to reach out to organizations that work with folks with disability and find folks that maybe don't have the training, but maybe have the skill. So you have to be aware that folks are out there with the desire to do all of this work, but don't have the opportunity. So you have to really, as he said, broaden the search. And that comes with all employment of people with disabilities. You have to broaden the search and make sure that, you know, you are engaging with these different organizations and this community as a whole. And, and language is important. I think one of the things that stops some, some production companies or some employers from engaging with this community is because they don't understand how to engage. So they're, they're self-conscious about the language. And so rather than put themselves in, a, in an awkward uh, situation where they, they might think they're going to say the wrong thing, they just won't engage. And so I think it's important to talk about language as well. And I'll concede the floor to someone else. <laughs> um, Delbert, can you, uh, can you speak to uh, the challenges that you've uh, found in your work? Yes, absolutely. Um, I also want to explain what Dodi was saying that, you know, we have to include people with disabilities um, in the creative aspect of it, in the decision making process of it, in the entire process. And we have to give them, um, you know, guidance as they make those decisions. I think it's key. For example, we see people struggling trying to find uh, individuals or actors. And I don't. I think a lot of those struggles could be reduced if we just brought in disabled people as producers, right from the ground floor, you know, as casting agents, or whatever, as directors. And I think those people, they're aware already of where to do that searching, where to find others in the community, and they can contribute a lot to the creative process and to the whole development. They can make sure the stories are authentic, and they can contribute contribute a lot of skills to this and come up with a real story, an authentic story for these people. So I think your struggle could be greatly reduced if, you know, right from square one, we include deaf people be, or disabled people right behind the camera, in front of the camera, in all aspects, you know, and behind as well. So we need to do that right from the start. Also, I think we have to involve um, the immersive language group, you know, the people who are doing the research and they're looking at things like captioning in VR, or AR, um, or UR. We need those people involved because we need deaf and hard of hearing people from my perspective involved in that and how they write that language. And think about your audience who's using the equipment and the technology, right? It's important to make sure that they feel engaged and not disenfranchised. So they're the people that should be benefiting from the technology. So I'll give you just a quick example. I mean, I've seen some common things out there in my experience and stories. People come up with new technology. They try to create a glove that will do American Sign Language while you're wearing the gloves and translate that into spoken English. 
And a lot of those people and those developers have no deaf researchers involved whatsoever. And it's common for deaf people to then be concerned about that. It's a very one-way um, relationship. And they don't understand how ASL and English, how those two languages work. And it's a two-way uh, approach, right? You have to think about how to do the interpreting from both. So we need to include deaf people and disabled people in your research and in your development right from the start. Absolutely. Um, Athena, uh, I'm curious, were you, in your involvement with the BRC VR project, um, were there any user groups, test groups, or what, what, what could you see that could be improved upon as part of that experience? Well, one thing I wanted to, to bring up and why I raised my hand is that we were trying to get the burners together that couldn't come together because of, of COVID, because of the pandemic. And it wasn't really a thought that we were creating something that was even more accessible because there's a lot of people that can't go to the Burning Man event because of health reasons. Uh, it's hard to move around on the playa without a special type of wheelchair um, if you're in a wheelchair. And so people that are wheelchair bound, people that have breathing problems or health problems in other regards can't go to that event but want to. And by creating BRCVR, we allowed these people to have access to a community, to a um, to activities that they wouldn't have access to any other way. So our first year was this aha moment of we created something that brings a larger group of people together. And then because of our principle of radical inclusivity, we started being like, okay, so who are we missing? Who do we need to like bring in? And that's when I reached out to the Blind Birders Project. But there's so much more than that. And we have been working directly with Altspace, which is the platform that we are on, um, that is owned by Microsoft. And after the first year, they realized uh, we need to bring people together that can't necessarily hear. So they created a captioning tool in Altspace. It's still in beta. It works pretty well and it's also available in nine languages so not only did it become a captioning tool for those who have difficulty hearing and you know even me i hear perfectly fine but in vr sometimes it's just kind of hard to understand what people are saying because of technical glitches so the captioning tool is great but it also translates so then the accessibility of non-english speakers or the fact that I can't keep my earbud in my ear. So the not being able to understand all the English speakers, now there's nine different languages that can come in and understand. It's not available in every single world. It is still in beta, but they are improving upon it and rolling it out. And our hopes is that that captioning tool can get translated into other ways in which we can help people access the community and, and create this global community together. The other thing I wanted to bring up is that we talk about user experience and user interface, and I am trying to change that lingo because in the immersive social VR space, in XR in general, we're no longer talking about users. I actually don't even like being called a user. We're talking about participants. This is a participant experience. And when you change that mindset, you start thinking about how is somebody going to participate with the technology that I'm creating? And that opens up a whole different world of possibilities, especially when we're talking about accessibility. Because when you're talking about somebody with low vision, it's not how they're going to use it, it's how are they going to participate with it. And same with people that are hearing impaired, that have mobility issues, how are they going to participate? We have to create the tools that allow them to participate as a part of the whole. And that's the miracle of XR and what we can create. We can create a world that everyone is part of. That's a great distinction to uh, label it as participants. I wonder if, 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 it's, um, um, if they'll start changing uh, software development development departments from you know UI, UI UX to uh, participant um, if that would have any 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 bearing but uh, I think that's a really, really I good hope point. So. Um, um, I'm wondering um, if anyone can speak to what 
inspires them the most about working in this space? Um, if anyone wants to jump on or maybe Damien. Well, what more inspire me here to work in, in this kind of content is, is how the people can be engaged uh, with immersive uh, experiences because you, you see that people feel like they are there um, and it's a, a tool that we should use to, in, in these cases for, okay, you can be a people with a, a disability also or, or whatever, and you can put the, the, the users, the people, the audience in, in situations and places that they are never been aware of or they could never think it about. And, and, and the empathy you can get is much uh, powerful than in any other media. So I think we, we got here a, a, a very powerful tool to change uh, people's mind. Um, and this is what inspired me to, to do and to do things in this kind of uh, media. Uh, I think that's that's what what more it's more interesting to me. That's great. Um, I Delbert. What really inspires me is you know the idea that people have access to things and not only to um, things that are set up to accommodate them, right? It's not just an accommodation issue, but it's ac accessible. So it's accessible for all, not just a few. You know, for example, uh, I work on captioning and I've worked on captioning in VR. And in some cases, it's not really beneficial to deaf and hard of hearing people, um, but it's also beneficial to people in the world, right? Who don't have language skills, right? They can use the captioning and with the different languages, as Athena said, you know, it, they can look at the spoken dialogue, um, but sometimes it's a different caption than what is actually said in the dialogue. So we really rely on the captioning. And so we're relying on hearing people to captioning. But I think we could market it to everyone in the world and, you know, we could show videos in different countries and different worlds um, using different languages and different captioning. And ASL, for example, people don't know American Sign Language, right? But we could use captioning to help people understand what deaf people are signing. So that's another benefit of captioning. So, I, you know, I think we have to look at things like that. Other examples, you know, VR uh, gives us a way to look at the experience people have with things. It's not a typical experience, um, maybe because they are disabled, you're right, or maybe because they don't have, I don't know, economic financial status or ability to travel to different areas or parts of their community. So this does give them access to that and to more people than not just the disabled, but also the non-disabled. So the benefits are there, it's inspiring. I'd love to hear it. Well, I, I, I'm sure we could keep this conversation going for quite some time, um, but we do have a few questions. So we'd like to move it over to um, the live Q&A portion and Jesse Taft to uh, cue us in. Thank you very much, um, Eric, Danny, Athena, Delbert, and Damian for sharing your insights, your advocacy, and your experiences. Um, we are almost out of time. So I'll just pick one quick question from the chat. This is a uh, sort of a combination of a few questions that were asked. Um, and it's about the future of haptics and touch. If you could each quickly say perhaps what you see as the future of haptics in VR and the entertainment industry. Thank you. Uh, I was just at the Augmented World Expo this past week and I was blown away at what was going on with haptics. For one, they're not bulky anymore. It used to be like a bulletproof vest that you would wear. Now they're down to just this thin shirt so that you can feel haptics. Um, there's a great company called Ghost Felix that came with, um, that uh, has a belt that helps you navigate direction in where you need to go. Um, it also works like in a car for driving to help you figure out what direction you need to turn. The haptics go in that direction. When I was at the MIT Hackathon, 
I met a young man who had developed a glove that um, you could do sign language with and that in virtual reality, your character, your avatar would then be doing the sign language and whatever you would be doing, it works on uh, three different platforms. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. He also open sourced it. Uh, if you have a 3D printer, you can print out the servos and the things that you need and assemble it yourself with about $60 worth of parts. Um, and there's a whole Discord channel of people that are helping other people build these gloves so that they can have full range of motion of their fingers and their hands, but they also have haptics in the gloves. So if you go to uh, pick something up in VR, you actually feel the thing in your hand that you're picking up. And uh, normally in VR, you don't, you, you pick something up and it's just this fake thing in your hand. So it's super exciting what's going on with haptics right now. Um, they are still little vibrations. We haven't gotten the full range of sound yet, but I guarantee that's coming. I mean, I would say something that just as easy as right here and you're, everyone's got a phone in their pocket. I mean, many people have phones in their pocket. I'm not gonna make presumptions, but building in haptics as indicators for, uh, for AR experiences is something probably the easiest way to get people uh, involved in that space and um, extremely helpful. For uh, for a lot of people, I think uh, anybody else. Too, um, I was just going to add to this. Uh, what what's fascinating too is that that when these technologies get developed around ideas of accessibility, we find that the market is expanded. Um, you know, to Delbert's point about captioning, for example, you know, whenever I watch a, a film. That is, uh, you know, like, I don't know who didn't watch Belfast at home using captions. So it's not just for, you know, those with hearing loss uh, or who, who are deaf. So the same thing is said of any of these kind of devices, you know, uh, where the market expands beyond people with disability to utilize these devices. It becomes a, it becomes a moneymaker all the way around in that sense. So that's th that I think is, you know, we can go back as far as looking at something as simple as curb cuts. So before curb cuts, they said, well, nobody's going to use them. We never see anybody out in wheelchairs. Well, they're not out because the curb cuts weren't there. So when they put the curb cuts in, now who uses them? We see, you know, parents uh, walking their kids with strollers, um, not just the, the wheelchair using community, but we also see delivery people benefiting from these curb cuts. So we have to understand that when these technologies come about and we make these changes, it's not just to benefit people with disability. Uh, if I could add. Yes, um, I'd like to add that one uh, way for deaf people, for example, to receive information is not only visually, but yes, it is through haptics and through feeling as well and touch. So we get information from vibrations, um, we get each other's attention by tapping each other on the shoulder. And so that's an example of haptic technology you know, that it can really add much more options and more accessible for deaf people. So also I'd like to add too that as Danny's point, as he was saying, um, you know, one of the things I've been working on is to expand on open captioning, what we call OC in the movie theaters. Because what we've noticed is that many hearing people want to look at the captioning. They want to read it, but they don't want to ask for the device, the thing that you have to plant in your chair with the little tiny screen on it. Um, and so the, they're not getting a high number of requests. But if we had more open captioning, and we've seen as it becomes available, more people will use it. And I think they understand the benefits of it, and they understand movies. Um, like Dune, for example, that just came out. Yeah. And a lot of people were complaining because it was really hard to understand the accents and what was going on. And so the, the captioning helped us understand this complex storyline. I think from the captioning point, I didn't know that I, as a hearing person, can ask for that device. I'm always afraid that I'm going to take it from somebody who needs it. Um, but I agree, Dune was really difficult to understand, and I wish I had the captioning. Um, on that note, 
I think this is all the time that we have for this panel. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us. Um, I am now I am going to pass it over to our next panel on testing and feedback with disabled users.